SJC 11733, William M. Ships v. Michael Morrissey. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Ships, you have uh, 10 minutes. Um, uh, in addition to speaking, listen very carefully because some of the justices may have some questions for you. So if you hear somebody speaking to you, please stop talking uh, and, and listen to the question and then you can answer the question. You ready to go? Yes, thank you. Uh, may it please the court, William M. Schiff, Jr., for the petition or appellant. When this court declared in District Attorney versus Watson, the Chapter 488 of the Acts of 1979 were unconstitutional. The first degree murder sentencing provisions provided by that act were naturally rendered null and void. Watson's declaration that Chapter 488 was unconstitutional did not somehow silently transform the final sentence of General Law of Chapter 265-2 into a new de facto sentencing provision for first degree murder. The final sentence of, of, of chapter 265, section two, was introduced in 1951, specifically as a no parole provision. The legislature rewrote that sentence in 1955, and they rewrote it again in 1956. Each time the final sentence of chapter 265 was written and rewritten by the legislature. It was kept separate and apart from the actual sentence to be imposed for first degree murder. Even when chapter 488 introduced a new sentencing scheme for first degree murder, the no parole provision in the final sentence of chapter 265, section two, was kept separate and apart. In addition to its origin and history, I argue in my brief that the unambiguous wording and phraseology of the final sentence of Chapter 265-2 clearly established that the final sentence is a parole ineligibility provision. It's not a de facto sentencing provision to be invoked when the actual sentencing provisions for first degree murder are somehow rendered unconstitutional. This court's decision in Watson left the sentencing statute, chapter 265-2, without a sentencing scheme for first degree murder. The question is now, what's the remedy? United States Supreme Court precedent and Circuit Court precedent, uh, they, they indicate that when a statute does not pres prescribe a penalty for an offense, an indictment for that offense must be dismissed. United States versus Evans from the Supreme Court and a case out of the Second Circuit, Mossow, M-O-S-S-E-W versus United States, 266 Federal Reporter, page 18, are very clear on this. Massachusetts has adopted a similar provision, but it's less drastic. In Massachusetts, when the entire sentencing scheme for offense is found to be unconstitutional, the indictment is reduced to the next lesser included offense for which a valid sentence exists. It's a reduction of the, set of the indictment rather than a dismissal of the indictment. In Commonwealth versus Gagnon, uh, th this court reduced the indictment for drug trafficking to drug possession because the sentencing provisions for drug trafficking were deemed unconstitutional. Massachusetts practice would therefore suggest that reducing the first degree murder indictment to second degree murder, the, le the, the next lesser included offense for which a valid penalty existed at the time, would be the proper remedy here. In the present case, however, I advocate for complete dismissal of the indictment under the federal practice. I realize that's a drastic measure. But I submit that complete dismissal of the indictment is proper because at the time of the offense, there was no valid penalty on the books for murder in the first degree. Watson had already voided 
the sentencing provisions for murder in the first degree. Continuing to bring indictments for an offense, even after the penalty for that offense, is deemed to be unconstitutional, and before a new penalty is enacted, produces an invalid indictment that should not be subject to, to a reduction, but only to a dismissal. I realize that, that, that that's going to the extreme, but it's an invalid indictment from, from the outset, rather than a valid indictment whose penalty is somehow later deemed unconstitutional. There is a procedural matter that I'd like to address. The district attorney has argued that this case is an attempt to do an end run around the gatekeeper provision of section 278-33E, chapter 278, section 33E. That's not true for at least three reasons. First, by statute, chapter 231A allows this court to declare the constitutionality of section Chapter 265, Section 2, as that statute is being applied to myself and to dozens of similarly situated persons. Uh, this court recently addressed a similar situation in Diachanko versus District Attorney, uh, where Diachanko brought a declaratory judgment action after already having received plenary review under Chapter 278, 33E and this court allowed him to proceed. Second, the constitutionality of Chapter 265-2 has historically been decided by this court. In my reply brief, I've provided several examples of cases in which this court has stepped in and decided the constitutionality of this murder sentencing statute. This case shouldn't be an exception. The court should address this issue. And third, a, a man named Patrick O'Shea is the third similarly situated person listed on page 31 of the record appendix. Mr. O'Shea pled guilty to an indictment charging first degree murder occurring just after the Watson decision. Under cases such as Commonwealth versus Robbins, 431 Mass, page 442, the gatekeeper provisions of section 2. 78 sub, subsection 33E do not even apply to Mr. O'Shea or any other person who has pled guilty to murder in the first degree. So the district attorney's claim that this is an end run around the gatekeeper provision is simply not true. We're asking for a straight declaratory judgment on the constitutionality of that statute, chapter 265-2, as it existed at the time of the offense, following the Watson decision. One, one additional matter I'd like, to, I'd like to ask the court to indulge me in. I can't imagine that this court would make a final decision in this case without reviewing the origin and, and history of the final sentence of Chapter 265-2. With the court's permission and for the court's convenience, I would like to submit a certified copy of the enacting and amending legislation of the final sentence, the 1951 statute, the 1955 statute, and the 1956 statute. They're quite short. They're only a paragraph each. I obtained certified copies, and I'd like to submit them with the court's leave. Okay, you can submit them in a 16L letter. Uh, or attach them to a 16L letter um, and uh, mail it to uh, the clerk of the court. I will do that. Thank you. Okay, now uh, stay on the line. Uh, 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 Assistant District Attorney Grant is here for the Commonwealth, uh, and uh, she has the opportunity to argue at this point. Very good. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. Marguerite Grant on behalf of Michael Morrissey, the District Attorney for Norfolk County. Um, Unless the court has any questions for me, I will rest on the arguments in the Commonwealth's brief. Anything? Do you, well, one question. Um, what do you say to 
Mr. Uh, Ship's argument that this really, yes, he's one person, but this really is no different than Diachenko. I mean, in terms of procedural question. Um, I would submit that I looked at the Averett Appeals Court case that's cited in the Diachenko opinion, and I understand that that's um, superseded by the Averett SJC case, but the analysis is very good in discussing when a um, declaratory judgment is appropriate and when it is not, and I would submit that on the facts of this case where this defendant has already had 33E review, um, where it seems likely that he would be wanting to take advantage of this court's interpretation of 265.2 in Diachenko, um, and, and where this court has many times said that uh, 265.2 does allow for um, um, life sentences with the possibility of parole for first-degree murders. Um, I would suggest that it's much closer to a, uh, an argument that he's seeking relief in his own case rather than seeking some sort of global um, question of law as in Watson, for example where the, uh, the district attorney for Suffolk sought a declaratory judgment. So I would suggest it's, it's, it's really closer to um, seeking relief in his own case. I can see that it's a, it's a, it's a question the court could go either way on, um, and I think the, the stronger argument in the Commonwealth's brief is Roman numeral two, the statutory construction argument. Um, I would point out that Mr. Ships is correct in his reply brief when he says that many of the statutes that I, many of the cases that I cited in that argument, including Valier, are actually construing a prior version of 265.2. They're construing the version of 265.2 that said a defendant convicted of first degree murder must be sentenced to death. Um, and the SJC in Valier and a whole lot of other cases said, um, Notwithstanding that language, we um, after Furman um, and Watson, after Furman, we're going to now rule that somebody convicted of first degree must be sentenced to life with, without parole. Um, I would suggest that although Valier doesn't doesn't construe the same version of 265-2 that was uh, at issue in this defendant's case. It stands for the proposition. It's, it's an even more favorable uh, <coughs> version of 265.2 that applied to this defendant because it held um, a defendant may be sentenced to death, and um, any defendant sentenced to, I'm paraphrasing, sentenced to um, first degree murder shall not be eligible for parole. It, it wouldn't make sense to have that provision in the statute unless there was the possibility that some defendants sentenced to first degree murder or convicted of first degree murder would serve life without parole. So um, I, of course, wrote Roman numeral one of my um, brief without the benefit of Diachenko II. Uh, but yeah, it was really the procedural question, not the substance that I was, yeah, but you've answered it. Thank you. Right. Unless the court Go has any other questions, I will rest on um, the Commonwealth's brief. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Ships. Uh, we're going to disconnect now.